Today we're going to be looking at DNA replication. The word replicate means to copy something, and that's what's going to be happening here. DNA is going to make a copy of itself. But before we understand how this is happening, we have to know when it occurs in what we call the cell cycle. So this is the cell cycle that we're looking at here, and it starts at the beginning of G1. This is whenever a cell is just first starting out. So I'm just going to put a little circle right there to represent a cell just beginning its life. So as the cell moves through what we call interphase, which is G1, and then the S phase, and then the G2 phase, eventually it's going to get to mitosis, and that's when the cell is going to divide. So by the end of this process, what we're going to see is that this cell that we have started with has divided into two cells. So by the end, cytokinesis, we should end up with two cells. So there's a line to show the beginning and the end. So what we're going to look at here is where the cell is copying its DNA. That is happening in the S phase. We're going to be going through the cell cycle more later on, so don't worry about each of the tiny details right now. We'll talk about what is happening at each one of these sections, but for right now, what I want you to know is that the S phase stands for synthesis, and that is because the thing that we are making here is DNA. This means that as a cell is moving through G1 phase, it's going to have a certain amount of DNA. And then when it hits the S phase, it's going to copy that DNA. So by the time it gets to the G2 phase, that cell will have twice as much DNA in it as then what it started with. So we're looking here at what we call a DNA replication fork. So what we're looking at is the DNA double helix is being unwound. So we sometimes use the term unzips when we're talking about the DNA getting pulled apart. Remember that what's actually holding together the DNA are the hydrogen bonds that exist between the nitrogen bases. So all we're doing right here is we are separating the two strands by breaking those hydrogen bonds. So we call this the DNA replication fork. Then what I want you to notice here is that we're already starting to make new DNA. The new DNA in our picture is being shown with a dark blue line right here, and then these three sections right here. This is all new DNA. Eventually what's going to happen is we're going to go from one DNA molecule that we see over here to two completely separate DNA molecules. That's what we're trying to do is copy the DNA. You should already know by this point that DNA is what we call anti-parallel, meaning that it runs parallel to each other, the two strands, but they run in opposite directions. When new DNA is being made, it can only ever get made in the five prime to three prime direction. So I'm going to start off by looking at this right here because this is the strand of DNA that's going to be made in what we call a continuous fashion because it's all one piece. These guys down here, they're going to be made in what we call a discontinuous fashion because they have to be made in little segments and later they'll get linked together. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But let's start with this one right here. And so what I just said is that DNA can only ever get made in the five prime to three prime direction. That means that this end must be the five prime end and this end must be the three prime end. If you remember from the video yesterday, five prime and three prime actually refer to the carbons that are in the um, sugar of DNA, so deoxyribose. But to remember this part right here, just remember that DNA always has to get made in the five prime to three prime direction. Now the other thing that we know to be true is that DNA is anti-parallel. That means that if this right here is the five prime end on this strand, then the strand directly opposite right here, that will be the three prime end. So they have to be opposite from each other. So now I'm gonna follow this strand all the way to the left here. So I'm following the strand. Okay, so there's the beginning of it right there. Since the opposite end was three prime, that means that this end down here will be five prime. And using the same logic, I can say, okay, well, if this is five prime, then the one directly across from it should be three prime. So I'm gonna go ahead and put three prime right there. And then I'm gonna follow that one completely till the end so it makes sense it's this one so since this side over here was three prime that's a three prime by the way that means that this side is five prime which makes sense because if you look at these new pieces right here that are being made we said that they each have to go in the five prime to three prime direction so that means for each of those strands that's the five prime end this is the three prime end there's the five prime end there's the three prime end. 
there's the five prime end and there's the three prime end. So what we end with is that these numbers are opposite from each other. That's the anti-parallel nature. So DNA is anti-parallel, it's parallel but runs in opposite directions, and new DNA can only be made in the five prime to three prime direction. Okay, so here's the same diagram, but this time I've added in some more words, including the five primes and three primes that we were just talking about. So a few more things I want you to notice here. We said that this right here is continuous synthesis because you can see it's just one piece. This we're going to see later. We have to do some kind of interesting things right there. That's why we call it discontinuous. Now, each of those little fragments on the discontinuous side, they were discovered by a man, a Japanese man named Okazaki, and so we call those Okazaki fragments. So a couple other things I want you to notice here is that the light blue DNA strands, so both of these right here, these are the original DNA strands. So we call that either the parent strand or the template strand. And that's because it's going to act like a template for this new DNA to be made right here. So the parent strand that we see using continuous replication, we call that the leading strand. And then the parent strand that uses the discontinuous replication. So these guys down here, we call that the lagging strand. Okay, so here's another diagram showing DNA replication. And there's a lot going on here. And I'm going to run through everything step by step. Um, so don't worry that you're seeing just a bunch of stuff here all at once. Now, another thing to keep in mind is that DNA replication is a process. And so because of that, to really understand it, it helps to see everything being animated. So for right now, I'm going to talk about the diagram. But when we are in class tomorrow, we're actually going to watch an animated version. And so between those two things, I'm hoping that you can start to visualize this process. So right now, I want you to focus on really understanding each of the enzymes that I'm about to mention. There are four, by the way. I want you to really focus on understanding the functions of each of those enzymes. So here we go, guys. First off, the dark blue DNA, that is our parental DNA, or what we call the parent strand or the template strand. And you can see that it runs from five prime. If you follow it all the way over here, there's three prime. And then you can also see that the number directly across from it is running three prime. And then over here to five prime. So anti-parallel DNA to start with. The light blue DNA is what is being made. So there's that continuous synthesis right there. And then there's our Okazaki fragments. They're not yet connected, but they will be soon. Okay, so step one is that DNA is in a double helix shape. It's wound around itself. It's coiled up, sometimes we call it. And so the first step is that we need to unwind the DNA double helix. And to do that, this is going to be our first enzyme. We call it helicase. And that's what each of these two guys are right here. They are helicase enzymes, and they are there to unwind the double helix. So that was step one. You can remember that helicase, it unzips the DNA, sometimes how we say that. Step two is not such an important step. Um, these little half circles right here, these are called single strand binding proteins um, or SSBs for short. And basically these are here to help keep that DNA sort of propped open because DNA has a tendency, it really wants to be in a helix shape. And so if we unwind that helix, it wants to just sort of coil back up on itself. So that's step two. Let's look at step three. And for this one, we're gonna see our second enzyme, which is called DNA polymerase. Make sure that when you're saying this, you are saying DNA polymerase, because later on, we're gonna learn about another one that deals with RNA. So for right now, we wanna call it DNA polymerase. That's what this little box right here is representing. DNA polymerase is the main enzyme here because it is what is actually adding the nucleotides in to the new DNA. So DNA polymerase essentially is making this new DNA right here. It is pairing nucleotides in what we call that complementary base pairing. So every time it encounters, let's say, an adenine or an A on the parent strand, it's going to put a thymine or a T on the opposite strand. And wherever there's a C, that's my cat in the background, wherever there's a C on the parent strand, there's going to be a G on the new strand, which we sometimes refer to as the daughter strand. So another thing I want you to notice is that it only works in the five prime to three prime direction. And that is what we're seeing right here is that DNA polymerase is making this light blue daughter strand.
You can also see it over here on the other side, on the discontinuous side, which we sometimes call this right here, the lagging strand. So here's a little problem with DNA polymerase. It only works in the five prime to three prime direction, but if you notice five prime to three prime for the daughter strands, these light blue strands, it goes the opposite direction. So then we kind of have this problem of like, okay, how do we keep the overall direction of replication moving to the left side when these little pieces right here want to be made going to the right side? So what DNA will actually do, what the um, DNA polymerase does, is this is why it's going to make the new strand, the lagging strand, in this discontinuous fashion. So what it will do is it's going to make first this Okazaki fragment, and then it's going to stop, it's going to back all the way up to here, and then it's going to make this fragment right here. And then it's going to stop, it's going to pick up, it's going to backtrack, and then it's going to start here, and it's going to go 5 prime to 3 prime. So Okazaki fragments, they're going to get made. This will be the first one that's made, then this one, then this one, and then this one, and it's going to keep doing that, in the, doing that in its discontinuous fashion until all the Okazaki fragments have been made. So I sort of am combining steps three and four, by the way. So step three, we saw DNA polymerase is making this new DNA. It's also doing it down here. It just has to do it in this kind of weird order where it starts with this one and then makes this one and then this one and then this one and so on and so forth until it runs all the way through the end of the DNA. Now something else that's happening here, and you can see it with this kind of reddish piece right here, this is called a primer. And primer means first, prime means first. And so you can think about this is the first, um, these are the first nucleotides that are laid down. So actually that little stretch right there, that is actually RNA, it's not DNA. And the reason for this is that DNA polymerase, which is this enzyme right here, it's also the one that's being shown right there and right there, this enzyme, it cannot start adding nucleotides onto nothing. So it's got to have something to start the process off, and that's what we use the primer for. So the primer actually is going to be made by its own separate enzyme. So this is going to be enzyme number three right here, and it's called primase. So there's primase right there. So primase first makes the RNA primer, and then DNA polymerase, it can go and make the rest of the Okazaki fragment. So it's going to go all the way down to this next RNA primer right here. Now something to also keep in mind is that by the end of this, we don't want any RNA here. We want only DNA. If we're copying DNA, then we should end up with only DNA at the end. So actually DNA polymerase, one of its jobs, there's actually different forms of it. We're not going to get into that. But one of its jobs is that it will actually go and replace these RNA nucleotides with DNA. So that was steps three and four. Let's go ahead and look at step five because this is where we're going to see our fourth enzyme and that is called DNA ligase. It's shown right here in the circle. Ligase comes from the word ligate, which means to sew, like when you're stitching something with like a needle and thread. So DNA ligase, essentially what it does is it joins together the Okazaki fragments, that last little bond right there where you can see that arrow, it needs to go and fix that last bond. So it's essentially sewing together the Okazaki fragments. Remember too that the bond that exists between a phosphate and a sugar, like in the DNA backbone, is a phosphodiester bond. And so that's what DNA ligase does, is it forms the final phosphodiester bond between the Okazaki fragments. So you can remember that it connects the Okazaki fragments. So this is going to keep on happening until we have gone all the way through this DNA. And then that way, by the time we're done, we're going to end up with two identical DNA molecules. Okay, so I think it helps to see just lots of different versions of this diagram. So here is yet another version of this. And so something to note here is that we do refer to the very beginning as the origin of replication. And then in the last couple different um, diagrams, we've actually been seeing only one half of this. So we've seen everything, for example, over here, but it didn't really show what was happening on the other side. When we're looking at just one half of all of this right here, we call it a replication fork. But then sometimes when we're looking at it like this, it's like two forks combined and all of this together, we call it a replication bubble. 
So if we were looking at an entire um, eukaryote's DNA, we would actually see multiple replication bubbles. And that's because DNA is going to be so long that it needs to actually start replication in several different points. And so this little diagram that I'm drawing down below, what this means is that we're going to have multiple origins of replication. And then eventually new DNA will get made using this parent strand and then this parent strand and they'll all just eventually join up together. So by the time we're done, we'll end up with two complete DNA molecules that are identical to each other. We're just going to start the process in multiple places to make it go a little bit more quickly. Okay, so back to the diagram above though. Let's make sure we know what's happening here, um, just like we saw in the diagram before. So I'm gonna use this to kind of review what's happening. So the first thing that I am seeing here is that this DNA, it is being made in the five prime to three prime direction, because that's the only way that DNA can get made is in the five prime to three prime direction. And so what we are seeing up top here is that this is the continuous fashion, that's my cat again, sorry. And so we would call this the leading strand. Down here, the light blue, that is the lagging strand, and that's because it actually does take the DNA polymerase a little bit longer to make it because of that discontinuous fashion that it's going to do. So step one actually is that we need to unwind the double helix. And so this little triangle right here, you can see it labeled on this side, that is DNA helicase. That was our first enzyme. It is going to unzip the DNA in both directions or unwind the double helix. Step two is that DNA polymerase is going to start joining together nucleotides using complementary base pairing. So that means that this right here, there's DNA polymerase, by the way, it is making new DNA in the five prime to three prime direction. And to keep the overall direction moving this way, then these pieces down below, they're going to get made in that discontinuous fashion. So this will be the first one made. This will be the second one made. Keep in mind that in order to start this process, we need to lay down what we call a primer, and that is going to be done by an enzyme that's actually not shown here called primase. And so that little green part right there that starts us off, that is RNA. It was made by RNA primase or just primase. And so and that's all these parts right here. These are also just RNA that's been made. So that was our um, third enzyme was primase. And then the fourth enzyme is what we call ligase. You can see it right here, and it is going to to ligate or sew together the Okazaki fragments. And so that's our last step is to complete the phosphodiester bond in the DNA backbone. That's what DNA ligase is going to do. So what we started with was one complete DNA molecule and what we're ending with is two complete and identical DNA molecules. Now keep in mind that these two parent strands after they unwind, they never come back together. You can actually see them as two separate molecules here now. Each parent strand, there's one right there, and then there's another one right there, and they are each being paired with a new daughter strand. So that means that from the original DNA, each new DNA molecule has one piece of old DNA and then one strand of new DNA. So what we just actually looked at on the last slide is what we call semi-conservative replication. And so let me explain what's happening here because actually these are three proposed models and what you're gonna find out is that two of them were not the correct model that was proposed. In fact, the correct one is B. A and C are not correct, but in order to understand why B is called semi-conservative, you have to know what at least A means here. So what A was saying is that after DNA, this is our original DNA, our parent strands, A is saying that after it makes the new DNA that the two parent strands join back together and then the two new strands join together. That was not the case. What we saw is the semi-conservative method, which is that the two original parent strands, they will never wind back together. Each new DNA molecule is going to have a parent strand as well as a new daughter strand. So these two are identical to each other in that they both are gonna have the same sequences, but also they each have a parent strand and a daughter strand. The dispersive model, this one's just kind of dumb. Somebody proposed this, but like it wasn't right. They were thinking that the parent strands would sort of just chop themselves up and integrate them into the daughter strands. And that was just kind of silly. And everyone was like, nope, nice try. But no, that is not the way it happens. So the way that it actually happens and the one that you do need to know very well is going to be semi-conservative, which is what describes DNA replication. We say that it is done in a semi-conservative manner.